The University of Oxford, the large infrastructure, science infrastructures that you have in Oxford, and the small innovative businesses here in Oxford are absolutely vital to Oxford's economy. Uh, the university itself is a huge employer, and with small innovative businesses, we know that small innovative, innovative businesses are two-thirds of the employment in this country and they drive growth and high quality jobs growth and coming off the back of a recession it's always those small businesses that drive it and if you're looking at the university and small businesses these are not two separate areas they are interwoven so last year in November um, Oxford announced its 150th spin-out company it has been spinning out companies since 1959 including Oxford Nanopore, a DNA sequencing company which is now worth a cool billion. And that spin-out process has been ramping up very quickly over the last few years. But it's not just the small innovative businesses that are produced from Oxford University, it is also those that start up themselves around Oxford increasingly rely on the collaborations with the universities, networking with the universities, uh, the administrative help of the universities. And this is where EU funding starts to come in because for years we, we have known that this pairing between businesses and universities has been vital to driving economies, but the Horizon 2020 programme has been excellent at providing juice to do that. So it actually started in 2014 demanding of universities you don't get uh, any money uh, unless you're actually working with these small businesses. Uh, and how does Oxford University do with that funding? Well, it comes top. Ahead of Cambridge and ahead of UCL, it's had nearly a quarter of a billion euros since Horizon 2020 started in 2014. So Oxford cares about science. I know, I've been here since uh, the referendum debate started seven or eight times now, twice at Diamond Light Source, twice at Hartford College. Um, there was a, another time recently about EU citizens' rights. Here's another time, I can think of more. But Oxford cares deeply about um, its science. And so does the science community at large care deeply about Europe and our relationship with Europe. During the referendum campaign, nearly all scientists were against leaving our, our matrix, our framework, our community, our ecosystem of the EU. We had Stephen Hawking and 150 fellows of the Royal Society write a letter about it. We had the science ministers from the last 25 years all line up together to say we should remain. We gathered 5,500 names of scientists for EU in a petition. There were 13 Nobel Prize winners that were for Remain and all of the vice chancellors um, of uh, the universities across the UK. Um, over 100 of them put their names to Remaining, not a single one in Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, Wales or England was for leaving. So, the strength of feeling uh, between Oxford and science and science and the EU and Oxford and the EU is all bound together. So it's no surprise that after Brexit um, it caused a lot of uh, concern immediately. One week after the vote we started at Scientists for EU collecting stories of what the damage was. We had lots of, uh, we had 400 submissions, lots talking about xenophobia, um, and uncertainty going forward, but there was already a hard impact of jobs turned down, people actually leaving, funding and hiring freezes, and diminished roles on EU projects. This trend has continued since. Um, at the time, UCAS dropped um, EU students coming here by about 7%. Since the vote, our participation on EU science programmes has dropped from 15% to 12%. Numbers of people leaving our universities has increased 19%, as well as us losing the European Medicines Agency, a Galileo lab has gone, Galileo contracts, that's the GPS system of Europe, um, are now under threat. And one year from now, we are going to drag and drop 3.5 million citizens, EU citizens, from guaranteed rights into a settled status. And given Windrush, how do you think that's going to come out? So all of these frameworks 
from Euratom, European Medicines Agency, European Investment Bank, Customs Union and the single VAT system are all things that our government has not adequately prepared for. Our science programme is covered until, until 2020, but afterwards it looks to be in jeopardy. Our government has been kicking cans down the road, but at some point it's going to meet a mountain of cans that it can kick no more. And the politicians at that stage, we posit, will need a route out. And that's why we are advocating a people's vote on whatever Theresa May can bring back so that we can evaluate again what Brexit really means. Now, I'm a scientist, so I think it's fine to experiment. But if experiments are going wrong and people are getting hurt by it, like in clinical trials, then it is only ethical to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we'll return, of course, to, uh, to the issue of uh, a, a referendum on the deal um, or people's vote um, in the final section. Can I ask you a, a couple of follow-up questions to, the, um, to um, the situation as we stand um, in universities and, and the prospects? And, and they're going to be a slightly kind of devilish advocate type questions because I'm sure other people um, come across them. I mean, one question relates to the ability to be outside not just the European Union but also outside the customs union and the single market and still be a member of programs such as Horizon 2020. To what extent do you think there will be a problem for the United Kingdom if he wishes to uh, and is willing to contribute to that program to continue to be a member of that program um, even if it decides to leave those other institutions as well? Right, well, the Science Commissioner, Carlos Moydas, has already said that the UK cannot be a full associated member in future because of our size and because of what our red lines are, then it means that we are going to have a bespoke deal, but not a bespoke deal in the way we'd like, a bespoke deal in the way that the rest of Europe gets advantage from us, but also contains us. Here are the key elements of that, and that is, if we are willing to pay our way and more to help out the rest of the system, then we are more likely to get more parts of that program. If we are prepared to engage in, in, in free movement, not just for scientists and their families, but sort of wider and embrace the spirit of it, that would then get us more depth of involvement in the program. They do want us in the program uh, to a degree because our expertise is good but there are parts of the program coming up such as investment in innovative businesses and small innovative businesses and that's a competitive area and there's very little incentive for the EU 27 who see the opportunity to get ahead to have us included in actually stimulating competitive business growth so they're going to tailor something for us that gets the best collaboration of our scientists but keeps some of the best bits in terms of you know, marketing scientific developments largely within the, the, the remaining EU. Right, oh, that's very good, thank you. Um, so another kind of troubling question may relate to, to that drop um, in numbers of people who may want to come here from the EU27 and, and Again, some people might try to argue, well, we are clearly now in a period of uncertainty. People don't know what the scope and, and the government is at fault for that, but that will get itself sorted and the UK still has top universities and it still attracts people from not just outside the EU, but indeed outside the Commonwealth, it attracts Americans, it attracts uh, Chinese. So um, why would that be not something that UK universities will be able to continue to do, again, even if freedom of movement ends. Okay, two factors here. One is the reputation of the country as a whole and the brand of the country as a whole, as, as, a, as a community. And that brand took a hit on the night of the Brexit referendum. As um, someone said to a, a BBC journalist that was in their article, 
the UK went from being cool to uncool very quickly. That, that was a scientist in one of the labs. And so even though our science community is more than welcoming because there are no foreigners in science, we're all an international community wherever you go, nevertheless the tone of the country as a whole can put people off. Scientists in, in the lab that then go out about town um, wearing different clothes and um, uh, speaking with accents oftentimes feel nervous given the current climate. So that makes it harder, you know, the branding of the country is very important as well as the branding of the university, especially if you want people to come here and bring up small children and that kind of stuff. They think very carefully about where they want to bring up their children. The other thing is, uh, very quickly, uh, in a competitive world it's always a game of fine margins. So if Oxford University is in a race with other universities across the world in order to get the best talent, because once you've got the best talent, then you attract more best talent. If you have a few years out of the game and you get behind the person you're racing with, even if you're running at the same speed, you're, you're behind and you have to have more to catch up. And, and if they're ahead, then they'll be drawing in the talent that then attracts more talent. That's the kind of dynamic that we're looking at. So we, we, we suffer for having a few years uh, off the boil. Thank you very much for that. Um, so um, I now want to invite uh, people's contributions. Uh, and as I said, there could be people who have experience at university or science or, or questions that you might have uh, for Mike. Anyone? Um, I see a hand down there. Yeah. And then there's one there. Yes, I'd like to make a sort of comment on, on, on the impact. Um, that's great. Let, let's collect a couple more and then I'll, I'll turn to Mike. Um, yes, there's a lady there. Yeah. Actually, on the bench doing the diagnostic work, 
doing your blood tests, look, doing your blood tests, telling the medical stuff what's wrong. He's been losing people, hand of the fist, since the Brexit vote, and he's unable to replace them. It seems that the uh, unwelcoming environment, hostile environment, even, uh, uh, that word of that is getting around now, and uh, it's difficult to get started. Thanks. Thank you. Let me take up final uh, contribution for this segment, just because I'm conscious of time, then I'll get back to Mike and we'll proceed uh, into the next section. I mean, obviously, there are some relevant links between the subject areas, so you can um, contribute there um, if you wish later. Comments to make. I'm a research scientist and I was at an international meeting on diabetic eye disease on the day of the vote. And when we woke up, when I woke up, I got a text message from my colleague and he said, I don't know if it's worth going to, bre to breakfast, Irene, we're out. And um, it's been very difficult and everyone was, everyone was devastated. And, I, and, and, I, and we found it, because we work in a very small area of research, diabetic eye disease, it's not a big area. And we do need to work very closely with our European colleagues. And I was on a, I've on a failed Horizon 2020 application and I've been asked to um, be on, an, on another one which is coming up um, in the next round. Um, and so we're trying to keep in there, but it is very difficult. And we're also members of something called IVITSI, which is a European um, Vision uh, Research Group. And we, and we contribute patients from our hospital into the um, into European trials, and we don't know if we'll be able to continue with that. And I'd just like to follow up on the lady over here with her three sons. Um, I've got two children, and my son's an occupational therapist. He's working in London at the moment, but he's thinking that he may go to Ireland because his wife has Irish, um, is able to get an Irish passport. And my daughter, on the morning of the results, said, Mum, I'm leaving the country, and she's going to the um, University of Delft do a two-year master's, and she said she's not coming back. Right. Oh, uh, nobody seems to be counting how nobody seems to be counting how many of these bright young people are going. Yeah. My daughter's 25. She's got a master's from Cambridge. A lot of her friends are going to Barcelona, um, Berlin, Amsterdam. I met a friend yesterday. His daughter's working in Amsterdam, been there for two years. No intention of coming back. And I've spoken to various politicians, and no one seems to know, or think, seems to realise that we're losing these very bright young people who would be the ones coming up in the next generation. Right. So. On this rather depressing note, uh, Mike, do you want to come back in about a minute or so um, if there are issues you want to raise, and then we'll, we'll carry on? Yeah, it's, um, it's not going to take a long time because I think we're all in agreement on, on these issues. Um, with Euratom, um, uh, to the gentleman over there, this is a great example of Brexit, where you shoot first and then try to resuscitate later. Um, there was no warning with Euratom. Um, it came completely out of the blue. I was stunned um, because there had been, before the announcement, two inquiries. Um, with, with dozens and dozens of submissions and it hadn't come out and then it just got thrown out of the blue without legal necessity. It was all about the European Court of Justice as the laws declared and then there you were with, with a community of 78,000 people with, with two years to prepare and they said they couldn't do it. Um, with regard to um, both of, of the ladies on either side talking about their children leaving, that is on one level, that's heart-wrenching um, because um, of what we're losing, but also I think it's, it's great for Europe that, that, that we get this, this free flow of talent going, and I think it wakes up a whole generation to, we shouldn't just be here, we should go exploring around. I do hope they come back, though, that's all. I hope that we can build a country for them to come back to that's fully part of Europe, and I think that itself should be a bold mission that we should set. And finally, in terms of uh, the, the um, filling jobs, yes, lots of people are saying that right across the board. You, we're losing people, and it's very hard to get the talent in to, to refill those places uh, when you're looking at the European market. You see that everywhere.